All right, we are now live for another reading from my book, uh, Reason Fulfilled by Revelation, the 1930s Christian Philosophy Debates in France. Um, we have done four live readings so far, and so this will be number five, and we're getting into a new section of the introduction at this point. So this will be a little bit longer than last reading, but about the same as the others so far. Um, before I get started, let me um, say that the, the reason I'm doing this is this is the 10 year anniversary of publishing this book that took me uh, roughly about what about uh, six years of research and then a couple of years of, <clears throat> of writing and editing and things like that going on. And so people, you know, were asking me about it. And I realized 10 year anniversaries are probably a good time to start doing this, this kind of thing. And I'll probably, once I finish all of these readings, be doing some, some videos specifically about um, some of the key ideas in the text. <clears throat> so this is um, from the introduction, starting on page, um, there we go, I'm a little picking the wrong thing. Page 46, thematic introduction, outline of positions articulated during the debates. Having sketched the historical context and unfolding of the 1930s Christian philosophy debates in the previous section, in this section I intend to provide fuller, more systematic exposition of some of the interlocutors' positions developed in the course of the debates. To specify precisely the purposes and limits of this section, five connected points need to be made. So first, I caution that the studies presented in this section are in fact bare outlines aiming at providing main theses, judgments, and distinctions of the various interlocutors' contributions to the debates. I attempt not simply to summarize, but also to allow these authors to express themselves in their own words, providing translations of terms and short passages, but a considerable amount of what is to be found in their writings has necessarily been passed over to some degree simplified here. This raises the second point, which is that these outlines are not designed to entirely substitute for, let alone replace, in-depth examination of the documents cited. The goal is instead to facilitate and to provoke further study of the debates, the philosophical and theological interlocutors, their positions, and their texts. Third, the outlines are designedly not comprehensive in another way in that summaries are not provided for a number of the documents and authors taking part in the debates. Some of the interventions are of clearly lesser, though not entirely trivial, importance than those selected for inclusion here. Providing assessments of them remains a task for a longer and more detailed study than is possible here. Fourth, the amount of space devoted to the authors and text corresponds to a deliberate choice to balance attention to works that either still remain untranslated or cannot be translated. For example, the lengthy and important discussions after Gilson's Société Française de Philosophie presentation with attention to overviews aiding study of text translated here. Also, more attention is given to the more manageable body of text from earlier on in the debate, a basic motive again being encouraging further Anglophone scholarship on the debates by providing a few clear inroads into previously unknown or at least unexplored terrain. Accompanying this is the motive to demonstrate uh, where that early on the debates offer much wider scope, greater complexity and depth of insights than is typically believed or taught, precisely by rendering a portion of its literature more uh, accessible to Anglophone readers. The fifth point is one particularly necessary to make, namely that these outlines are avowedly the product of my own scholarly work on the debates and their documents. As such, though I have attempted to represent them as fairly and as accurately as possible. These studies remain flawed, partial, perhaps even on some points in error or misleading. The only possible remedy for this, of course, is emendation by my peers engaged in further critical and informed scholarship on the debates, the figures, the texts, and the very notion of Christian philosophy. 
So that's the, the introduction to this section. Here's the next subsection. The rationalists, Emile Brehier and Leon Brunschweig. The positions staked out by Brehier and Brunschweig early in the debates incarnate two different attitudes of the French rationalist mentality and establishment towards Christian philosophy. As Blondel would point out on certain points, they were actually incompatible. Still, their two positions are broadly representative and both set out clear and well-structured sets of challenges to which any position arguing in favor of Christian philosophy would have to respond. Since Brehier's position arguably sparked the debates and is in certain respects both bolder and cruder than Brunschweig's, his provides the natural starting point. Is there a Christian philosophy? From the start, Brehier correctly pointed out that the key issue was not a purely factual one resolvable simply by noting the historical existence of philosophers who were Christian and philosophies developed in Christendom. Instead, there was a question that had to be resolved normatively, and Brehier envisions only two types of resolutions, each providing a possible concept of Christian philosophy. Either it is a philosophy deemed acceptable by religious authority as in accordance with dogma, or alternately, it is a philosophy developing in some positive manner from starting points or an inspiration provided by Christianity. While granting the historical instantiation of Christian philosophy's first sense, he maintains that this cannot be genuine philosophy, since reason, uh, here we go, yeah, since, uh, since reason in whose free and self-critical exercise philosophy consists is subjected to an authority outside itself. The second sense must be evaluated by turning to history, considering significant possible contenders for the title of Christian philosophy. In each case, Breyer argues, no Christian philosophy faithful to both terms is generated, and thus there is no Christian philosophy. He begins with the Church Fathers and St. Augustine and judges them to merely adapt Greek philosophy to Christian uses. He reads into Augustine an unbridgeable gulf between logos as the fixed immutable world order sought by Greek philosophy and logos as the incarnate word of Christianity, as well as a definitive choice for the latter rendering his thought non-philosophical. Turning to St. Thomas Aquinas and conceding that he distinguishes philosophy as an autonomous science from religion and theology, he argues that since Thomas makes Christian faith the measure of truth, thus an index for the adequacy of a philosophy, he withholds from reason and philosophy their own initiative, autonomy, and criteria of certainty, a condition that he holds they cannot legitimately accept. An unduly weakened reason is thus subordinated to faith. Brehier's interpretation of 17th century philosophers stresses the opposite dynamic for their projects of employing unharnessed reason to demonstrate truths of Christian faith, generate genuinely autonomous philosophies with no intrinsic connection or need to culminate in Christianity. Interestingly, he invokes Pascal's criticisms of Cartesianism, but does not consider his thought as a possible Christian philosophy. 19th century philosophy offers two different candidates, both using Christianity to order and organize their philosophical systems. Traditionalism, distrusting the individualistic, abstract, emancipated reason of the revolution, makes religion, specifically Christianity, and language into the necessary requirements for the proper exercise of reason, in the process turning Christianity into a mere means for an organic social sphere. Brehier points out that the end point of this is Comte's positivism and religion of humanity. He designates a similar end point for the Hegelian experiment in Christian philosophy, which rationalizes Christianity on a yet higher level in Feuerbach's atheistic humanism. The last philosophy he considers is Blondel's, which he dismisses with a dilemma. Either it is Christian apologetics from the start, therefore not philosophy, or the problem of action it focuses on, gives it an ethical direction with no intrinsic connection to Christianity. Brehier in the Société Française de Philosophie session. 
After Gilson's presentation, Brehier responds first by reiterating and fleshing out his earlier distinction, ascribing Christian philosophy to extremely distinct senses. He says, in a first sense, it exists, but it is of no interest to philosophers. In a second sense, it would have interest for philosophers if it did exist, but it does not exist. In his view, determining what Christian means requires recourse to the views and judgments of some designated group, which adopting Catholic parlance, he terms a magisterium. Although this criterion then permits some philosophy to be denominated Christian by the religious authority, this is something extra philosophical. Taking the Catholic magisterium as an example, he points out that the scope of its purview seems to vary considerably in different eras. The result is, quote, an absence of precise limit in the philosophical domain this magisterium oversees and a lack of consistency in its censure. These make Christian philosophy in the first sense to be something completely arbitrary. He then supplies a formulation for tackling the second sense. Quote, the question is knowing whether Christianity as such, insofar as revealed dogma, has ever been the starting point of any positive philosophical inspiration. He bases his own response on his historical research, from which he calls two main interrelations between Hellenistic philosophy and Christianity. For one, they share the same basic subject. He says, the essential dogma characterizing ancient philosophy is the dogma of a word, a dogma of a logos, a dogma of reason. And thus its fundamental concern is this universal notion of what is rational in things and in human thought, of that through which the divine or the reasonable can penetrate into things. Christianity is also concerned with the logos, Christ, and thus similarly with knowing what the intermediary between God and men, God and the world is. He goes so far as to maintain that Christianity and philosophy raised exactly the same problems and to affirm that what continues to be essential in philosophy is always under one form or another the existence in reality and in the mind of some element that is connected to the divine. Yet, while asking the same question, they differ in the method by which they ask it, and Brehier identifies this difference precisely as between an eternal notion of the word, which invites us to a rational explanation of the universe, and a history, a mysterious history which can no, be known only by revelation, and which thus adds itself from the outside to the, the eternal notion, but which does not add anything to it. Brehier co concludes with another lapidary and indicative formulation. He says, Christianity is essentially the mysterious history of the relations between God and man, a mysterious history which can only be revealed, and that the substance of philosophy is rationalism. That is the clear and distinct consciousness of reason that is in things and in the universe. Brunschweig in the Société Française de Philosophie session. While Brehier sets out a position marked by clear commitments, bold formulations, and rigid dichotomies, Gilson's former professor proposes a considerably more nuanced position, requiring considerably more work to pin down exactly. He begins by admitting, I would not recognize myself in what I think and what I feel if the entire movement of Christianity had not existed, and ends by according Malbranche, the privilege and the honor of being the representative, naturally not the sole representative, but the typical and essential representative of a Christian philosophy. But along the way, he introduces a further refinement into the problem and argues that most contenders to the title fail either as Christian or as philosophy. He suggests that an adverb be appended to the term so that the issue becomes one of specifically Christian philosophy. This is in turn, he argues, this in turn, he argues, introduces a dilemma. If one is a philosopher, the substantive remains in some way immovable after the adjective. In return, if one is a Christian before being a philosopher and rather than being a philosopher, the situation is reversed. In the first horn of the dilemma, there is nothing specifically Christian about the person's philosophy, his use of reason, his procedures, his assumptions, 
remain the same as those of non-Christians. He says, the author of a system of philosophy can assuredly be Christian, but this is only an accident without any relation with that philosophy, as we would say for the author of a treatise of mathematics or of medicine. Brunschweig devotes more discussion to the second horn. Christianity's basis is in Christ, the incarnation of the Messiah, something exceeding reason, and therefore providing no foundation for philosophical reason to build on. The philosophy in Christian philosophy will then, as he says, designate a process of thinking, a movement, a progress of the entire man, but one that directly overturns reason's regular procedures. Pascal provides an exemplar for this, and Brunschweig grants that it is legitimate to consider Pascal as a philosopher, but this comes with the cost of considering him a philosopher in some way beyond, par de la in French, philosophy. On the horn of this dilemma, we grasp, he says, the deep meaning of Christian philosophy where the adjective radically denies the noun, an admittedly pyrrhic victory. If his Christianity has taken possession of the entire man, he writes, it is by uncovering for him a way of philosophizing that is not that of philosophers. The implication being that such a way of philosophizing cannot rightly be called philosophy. Brunschweig is also willing to place St. Thomas Aquinas' thought in this category, but adds that it also lacks the properly rational meaning of philosophy because that re the reason that precedes the 17th century had not yet arrived at maturity. He does, however, grant the possibility of something it would be appropriate to call without equivocation and without compromise a Christian philosophy. In fact, he identifies Malbranche as an example of this. He writes, this is the case where a metaphysician reflecting in a manner deep and naive at the same time would arrive at the conviction that philosophy ends up only raising problems, entangling itself in difficulties. The clearer a consciousness it will have of these problems, the deeper it will sound the abyss into which these difficulties throw philosophy, the more it will be persuaded that only Christianity's own solutions will satisfy the philosophical problems. He could perhaps have singled out Blonell on whose dissertation committee he'd been a member for this third possibility. Brunschweig's rationalist idealism also introduces a new wrinkle to the problem. Challenging the very distinction of divine revelation and its contributions from the products of human reason such as philosophy. Similar to Hegel, Brunschweig holds that, quote, faith, insofar as faith, is only the prefiguration, the sensible symbol, the approximation of what properly human effort will be able to set in full light. Considered in this light, the Thomistic baptism of Aristotle, completion of philosophy, the Aristotelian type, by a theology through imagination of a supernatural and transcendent order, would involve conflicts of two modes of what is at bottom properly human thought. Though Brunschweig's rationalist interpretation of Revelation in his larger works seems weakly supported by invoking the problem of pre Judaic, Babylonian, Egyptian, etc., origins of contents of so called revealed dogmas restricted to the faithful of a particular cult, during the debate he raised an important issue not addressed by many of the interlocutors the significance of involvements of human beings, faculties, and even culturally conditioned and mediated disciplines in divine revelations, provision, and transmission. All right, next portion, revelation generative of reason, Etienne Gilson. Buttressing his position by interpretive exegesis of key figures from medieval philosophy, Gilson argued for the demonstrative historical existence of examples of Christian philosophy. He also probed into the bases of various groups rejecting its possibility, criticized what he took, wrongly, to be the Blondelian position, argued for the legitimacy of the notion of Christian philosophy, and provided it a number of characterizations and definitions. All told, Gilson produced a coherent, robustly developed position still regarded as the definitive one by many contemporary proponents of Christian philosophy, the notion of Christian philosophy. 
In his Société Française de Philosophie presentation, the form Gilson's approach takes to the entwined questions of Christian philosophy's possibility and correct notion is reminiscent of Thomas Aquinas's favored framework for addressing issues. He begins by reviewing three positions opposed to Christian philosophy's possibility, then brings up Augustinian positions for it. While recognizing and appropriating valuable elements and insights from Augustinian positions, he criticizes them as insufficiently philosophical. Then, after having thus cleared the ground, articulates his own position. Two of the positions opposed to Christian philosophy, rationalism and what he calls theologism, offer similar resistance because they share a number of assumptions in common, but argue towards the same conclusion from opposite ends deriving from radically different valuations of Christianity and philosophy. From the theologist perspective, Quote, where Christianity is, it is useless or dangerous that philosophy be. Likewise, from the rationalist one, quote, where philosophy is, it is dangerous that Christianity should be. Where the rationalist sees in religious faith, dogma, or authority forces inevitably restrictive and corrosive of the reason that provides philosophy's principles, essence, and ends, the theologist, or fideist, sees in philosophy an unsupported human reason a temptation to prideful knowledge, incompatible with Christian faith and salvation. For rationalists, by its being Christian, Christian philosophy degenerates into mere apologetics and thus deviates from the search for truth, while for fideists, by its being philosophical, it etiolates Christian revelation and life. <clears throat> The third, the neo-scholastic position, holds that since both are grounded in truth, faith and reason are ultimately in agreement, but that a Christian dogma and revelation can at most supply philosophy with a negative criterion of its adequacy and full use of reason. It cannot provide any distinctive starting points, princi principles of inference, proofs, methods, or conclusions to philosophy, which would then be transferred to theology. Philosophy is and must be an enterprise carried out by employment of a human reason that remains the same whether in a Christian or non-Christian. <clears throat> Gilson discusses three main Augustinian positions for Christian philosophy, the first being Augustine's own project involving philosophical assimilation and unfolding of truths believed by faith in which, in the conditions of its exercise, reason enters into intimate relation with faith. The second position takes the form of medieval and modern interpretations of Augustine construed as Christian philosophy against peripatetic and Thomist philosophy. Homing in on the third, which consists in contemporary analogs to the second position, he differentiates, quote, the Thomistic attitude toward the concrete from the Augustinian. St. Augustine always seeks notions comprehensive enough to embrace the concrete in its complexity. St. Thomas always seeks notions precise enough to define the elements that constitute the concrete. In a word, the former expresses the concrete, the latter analyzes it. For the Augustinian, in a Christian philosophy, Christian person's philosophy, authentically grasping and grappling with the concrete, faith and reason become fused in a unity, resulting in a Christian philosophy. But while producing, as he says, a correct description of the reality to be explained, Augustinians refuse to provide its explanation by carrying out philosophy's task of analyzing it into concepts. Josson sets both Bergson and Blondel into this category, and while conceding the, val the validity of their critiques of reification of abstractions, argues that their rejection of concepts and the philosophy of the concept renders their work something lesser than philosophy, with the implication that neither could therefore supply a Christian philosophy. There is, however, a vital insight to the Augustinian position, which becomes a keystone in the edifice of Gilson's position, namely the real unity of philosophy and Christianity in the philosophizing subject, human subject. Likewise, faith and reason are rooted in the human subjects in which they exist and come into fruitful contact. We do possess concepts of the Christian religion and philosophy corresponding to their essences, but they do not possess existences independent of their subjects in which they are united and integrated. And so a Christian philosopher's reason is not something different from the reason of a non-Christian philosopher, but it is conditioned by the coexistence of non-rational Christian faith in the philosopher. 
against those who would seize on this to claim that Christian, the Christian's reason has thereby been vitiated, Gilson points out that every philosopher's reason coexists with something non-rational. He follows that up by noting that the Christian philosopher is, quote, convinced of the rational fertility of his faith and sure that this fertility is inexhaustible. Christian philosophy's rational legitimacy having thus been established, historical research can be carried out to discern whether there can be found, quote, philosophies, that is, systems of rational truths whose existence cannot be explained historically without taking account of Christianity's existence, since in them Christianity played a significant role in the constitution of them. Within such philosophies, Christianity would have opened possibilities for further determinate development of rationality by philosophy, so that in the concrete human subjects engaged in philosophy, Christianity proved to be a revelation generative of reason, right? <laughs> That's where I got my title from. While rhetorically leaving the historical existence of Christian philosophy as an open question to be decided by research and the question whether such philosophies possess genuine value to be one for rational critique, in the con context of his body of previous work and commitments, Gilson leaves no doubt that he considers these questions definitively answered in the positive. All right. Gilson's Société Française de Philosophie discussions with Brehier and Brunschweig. As the main presenter, Gilson engages the two rationalists in debate immediately after their presentations. The first quickly devolves into a near complete rout for Breyer, while the second is far more evenly matched and inconclusive. Gilson leads off by grasping Breyer's dilemma by both horns. While granting that the Christian magisterium acceptance of philosophy is an important element of assessment in order to determine a philosophy's Christian character, Gilson stresses two points. First, the actual historical workings of the magisterium are more complex than Breyer's oversimplified picture grants. More importantly, quote, the totality of ecclesiastical decisions, whether positive or negative, would not in any manner establish a system of philosophy since magisterial declarations bear on the compatibility of philosophical doctrines or systems with Christianity, not on their value or status as philosophy. So even though no such list has ever been produced, if the magisterium promulgated an ideal catalog of philosophical truths, this would generate a theological, not a philosophical document. Thus, Christian philosophy in the first sense Breyer grants it does not exist. In its second sense, he argues that it does exist. Gilson candidly admits, I follow a different historical method than Breyer, and he goes to suggest that his opponent's interpretations go beyond the support of textual evidence by paving over open questions with unargued for assumptions. Gilson writes, I agree entirely about the primordial importance of the doctrine of the Logos, but I do not recognize for myself the right to say that it is the philosophical question or even the Christian question. My personal studies, and as far as I know, those of others, are not advanced enough so that I could dare to make such an affirmation. He points out another problem. There are non-Christian notions of the Logos. Does this prove that there does not exist a specifically Christian notion of it? For if there is one, we find the existence of Christian philosophy proved on the very ground where one wants to deny it. He further problematizes two assumptions underlying Breyer's interpretations of Augustine. Quote, are the philosophical truths St. Augustine says he found in Plotinus' work independent of all Christian influence? Was what he says he did not find there indifferent to the philosophical order? Both of these would have to be true for Mr. Breyer's thesis to be proved, but both of them seem doubtful to me. Gilson then cites his interlocutor's own texts in which he maintained a difference between the Jewish philos logos and Christian logos and downplayed Augustine's dependence on Greek philosophy. In this way, after having said that there is no Christian philosophy, you add that it is only with many precautions and reservations we may speak of the Platonism of St. Augustine, that self-knowledge has a different meaning in Augustine, Augustine's and Plotinus's works, that as in the case of self-knowledge, Augustine's interpretation of intellectual knowledge sets him apart from Plotinus. How do you make these two theses agree? Breyer's response to Gilson's criticism character, characteristically shifts the ground of his argument. 
he, he says, doctrinal continuity is something of very little importance. In philosophy, everything is the method, the way that one sees things. The rest of their conversation consists in Gilson methodically pressing point after point and Brahir backpedaling from his position into assertions either progressively more vacuous or dubious. Again, citing his opponent's own history of philosophy, Gilson says, you show us, for example, that in St. Paul's works there are stoic elements, but you add that properly understood, Christianity's fundamental trait is absent in Epictetus's work, who, as Pascal said, did not know man's misery and who makes man his own savior. There is then in St. Paul a, a fundamentally different attitude from that of a Stoic philosopher. This case exemplifies the Gilsonian understanding of Christian philosophy's development and is set out in a concise argument. St. Paul was introduced to a point of philosophical anthropology, man's misery, but in a non-philosophical way, since according to you, these speculations must end up later in Pascal's Pensees, there is, despite everything, philo philosophy at the end of this perspective. It was therefore implied in the starting point, and though there's actually no philosophy in St. Paul's text, it was able to be generative of philosophy. This leads Gilson to ask a general question, formulated two ways. Of the Christian influence in philosophy, has it not produced specifically doctrinal, rational, and speculative differences? And does it not seem to you that there are ideas, basic and extremely, extremely elementary ones, about which we would have to have a discussion? The effect of Judaism's and Christianity's monotheistic conception of God furnishes a specific example and provides occasion for the spectacle of Brehier first expressing doubts whether monotheism entered into philosophy from Christianity, then from Judaism, then whether it's moral influence and philosophy derived from these religions. Then, when Gilson pins the issue down to the way in which it had an influence on metaphysics, whatever it may be, is its origin philosophical, purely and exclusively rational? Brehier suggests this remains a problem for further study. Gilson retorts, Actually, Christian philosophers have interpreted these words from Exodus, ego sum qui sum, as signifying God as being, no longer simply the good as in Plato or pure thought as in Aristotle. Where does this come from? He sweeps aside the suggestion that it does come from Aristotle. And when then, when Brehier brings in the question whether Exodus's formula would have been treated philosophically if Aristotle's theology had not existed, he rightly points out the rationalist confusion of two different issues. I do not know at all whether there would have been a Christian philosophy without a Greek philosophy, but that doesn't prove that there has not been a Christian philosophy. They continue the dispute, moving to the conception of creation, which introduced the idea of beings, of existence as radical contingency, no longer that of intelligibility or of order as in Greek philosophy. Brehier first tries to claim that creation is found in Plato's Timaeus, only to have pointed out that the demiurge is a rather different and lesser notion, not involving generation of being itself, which enters philosophy through the biblical creation account. He then brings up the fact that all philosophers make recourse to the idea of creation, a point whose irrelevance Gilson observes, saying, my thesis is not at all that the Christian revelation introduced philosophical ideas that are valuable in every time and which would be universally valuable in all times. The question that I ask is that of knowing whether it did not introduce ideas that became ph philosophical and valid for authentic philosophers. The discussion between Brunschweig and Gilson immediately centered on the issue of rationality and contestation of the former's dismissal of pre-17th century reason as underdeveloped. Again, Gilson uses his opponent's own text. He writes, the fact that for you, as you explained long ago in the Introduction à la Vie de l'Esprit, that there is no true rationalism except in nominalism's lineage does not prevent there being another meaning, just as or even more legitimate of the word reason. The two philosophers circle each other, sparring first over the philosophical legitimacy of the Aristotelian exercise of reason, a conceptual and not nominalist exercise, and by extension, philosophies for which there are concepts and admit the reality of the concept. Then the judgment of predication developed and relied upon by the peripatetic tradition comes in for comparison with the 17th century rationalist judgment of relation. The interlocutors do not really come to grips until Josson argues at length that 
Quote, for St. Thomas Aquinas, philosophy was perhaps Aristotle in a certain sense, but that what was original in the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas flows much more directly and more deeply from Christianity than from Aristotle himself. Gilson sidesteps Brunschweig's earlier raised problematic about revelation and the supernatural order by clarifying the commitments of his position. It suffices for my thesis's requirements that what of philosophical sources can be found in the Bible are not encountered there in a philosophical state. Whether the Bible derives from God's supernatural revelation or from an imminent religious human intuition, quote, the result would be the same. For the origin of the philosophical speculation is not itself philosophical. The question is knowing whether there exists philosophy that has come from something that is not philosophy. According to Gilson, Thomas Aquinas's philosophy not only furnishes an example of this process, even the concepts and terminology it borrows from Aristotle are transformed in the light of the Christian revelation's contribution. He then turns explicitly to the rationalist interpretation of 17th century philosophy, arguing that even in Pascal's case, there is a generation of philosophical ideas in contact with his faith and his religious life. His choice of Pascalian discussions of the two infinities is an illustration of Christianity contributing notions of the divine that go beyond Greek conceptions, thereby enriching the historical development of philosophy, elicits a double response from Brunschweig. On the one hand, Pascal would not have gotten his conception of the infinite from Thomas, who as an Aristotelian conceives the totality of being as being finite. On the other, not only was his conception of the, quote, infinitely large and infinitely small derived from modern science, and instead of recognizing there what you seem to see as sign of God's infinity, Pascal felt it as a cause of man being crushed precisely by reason of the impossibility of the physical universe leading us to God. Brunschweig concludes the infinite for St. Thomas before Copernicus as for Pascal after Galileo is inhumane, inhuman. It is not divine. This would be rather a surprise to Thomas. And as Gilson points out, while the notion of the infinite plays a different role in St. Thomas's natural theology than in that of Pascal, the notion of an infinite God is common to both and it's closely tied to Pascal's metaphysical speculations. Their portion of the debate closes with some degree of agreement about Pascal and Malbranche. The real difference lying in what their basic assumptions about philosophy entail for their interpretations of the two. For Braunschweig, in Pascal, there is no philosophical thought, properly speaking, that is not impregnated by Christianity in each of its movements, and this disqualifies his work as philosophy. Gilson does not regard this as a problem. He says, I do not see why even for a man like Pascal, one would have to say that Christianity absorbs philosophy to the point of suppressing its existence. To the contrary, I would see quite well Pascal's acceptance of the supernatural order engendering in his work a philosophical plan. For he distinguished the order of thought from the order of charity, the latter infinitely superior to the former. He ends on the only note of complete agreement with Brunschweig possible, the assessment that Malbranche is a Christian philosopher and a link in the chain of the history of Christian philosophy. Two other important engagements, 1932-1933. In his Gifford Lectures, The Spirit of Medieval Philosophy, Gilson provides the sorts of detailed and systematic studies he had deferred in the Société Française de Philosophie session and referred to as necessary to truly decide the issue in favor of the historical actuality of Christian philosophies. Since that work was long ago translated into English and a sizable body of scholarly commentary and criticism of it already exists, I will simply indicate five of its features particularly relevant to the context of the debates. The first is that the bulk of the work is devoted to detailed exposition of numerous classical examples of the same basic dynamic of Christian revelation providing occasion for novel philosophical development. The second is that his approach, in his approach to each of these notions, issues, or experiences contributed to philosophy by Christianity, Josson also sketches short histories of their appropriation, transmission, amplification and reinterpretation within traditions of Christian thought. Presenting a picture rather more complicated than Christianity once and for all seeding contributions that then philosophy labors on incomplete independence. This leads to the third feature 
a new definition of Christian philosophy. He says, I call Christian every philosophy <coughs> which, though, although keeping the two orders formally distinct, nevertheless considers the Christian revelation as an indispensable auxiliary to reason and includes in its extension all those philosophical systems which were in fact what they were because a Christian religion exists and because they were ready to submit to its influence. He again stresses that the concept does not correspond to any simple essence susceptible of abstract definition, but corresponds much more to a concrete historical reality as something calling for description implying that the definitions he himself supply require as support the sorts of descriptions provided through his interpretive exegesis. A fourth feature of interest is his expanded critiques of three positions construed as his main rivals, rationalism, neo-scholasticism opposed to Christian philosophy, and Blondell's philosophy, the, the latter targeted not by name but under the aspects of a philosophy open to the supernatural and of those who, without denying the legitimacy of philosophy, would incorporate Christianity whole and entire within. A fifth particularly interesting feature is that Christian philosophy is framed not as an entirely past actuality but as a present and perennial possibility. Medieval Christian philosophy exerted, he says, its influence beyond the limits of the Middle Ages and will continue to exert its influence as long as there are men to believe in the possibility of metaphysics. Even more generally, the formation of a Christian philosophy was inevitable. It is still so today and will so remain as long as there are Christians and Christians who think. Jusson also became directly involved in the conversations after both sessions at the Societe Thomis Second Day of Studies, provoked by the intransigence of Pierre Mondonet's remarks. He begins by saying, I had made a promise to myself not to speak, then makes a number of illuminating remarks and answers. First, he points out an inconsistency in the purely personal or extrinsic relation between philosophy and Christianity held by the neo-scholastics. There, if, he says, if there are factual relations between faith and reason, between revelation and philosophy in a concrete subject, it is impossible that there is no normative relation. Although the formula is classical and entirely satisfies them, Josson concedes himself willing to give up the term Christian philosophy and notes that a better needs to be provided because the expression designates a reality, namely the enrichment of Greek philosophical thought by the, by the Christian contribution. Bruno de Solage asks of Gilson whether Christianity's new contribution is similar to the influence of another great philosopher or of a philosophical school introducing new ideas, or does this influence possess something particular to it, something that doesn't resemble any other influence? Gilson answers, I have the impression that no, the influence is not of the same order. When our philosophers received the notion of God as being or that of creation, they were especially struck by two things, their perfect rationality and that nevertheless, reason alone had never been able to discover them. What a philosopher gives over to another philosopher is something rationally inferred and demonstrated. What St. Justin, St. Augustine, and St. Hilary found was something rational that came from an extra rational source. Responding then to Mondonet's repeated insistence that what he, and by extension Maritain, means by Christian philosophy is simply theology, Josson articulates the distinction between philosophy and theology from a different set of angles than usual. There is an essential difference between the attitude of the theologian who sets himself up in the revealed data and asks reason what the revelation is, and the attitude of the philosopher who sets himself up in the rational order and asks faith in what matters it may enrich reason's knowledge. The fact that reason and faith play a role in theology as they do in philosophy does not at all imply that they play the same role role there. The theologian's conclusion is always something revealed, whatever appeal he may make to reason, that of the philosopher is always something rationally demonstrated, whatever appeal he may make to faith. Another interlocutor, Masnovo, argued that Christianity's relations with philosophy were, for the most part, extrinsic. 
It could have an intrinsic relation, only that philosophy grasps, quote, its powerlessness to completely resolve the problem of life that it itself raises and in which it essentially consists and the consciousness derived from this of being pushed to seek out by another path, the full solution, a seeking that ends up factually in Christianity. Masnovo's formulation contains echoes of Blondel, and Gilson makes several points in response. He contests the unduly restrictive interpretation of relations between Christianity and philosophy. He writes, for a Christian, even the fides ex auditu, when it is received as such, does not seem to me to constitute an extrinsic relation. He suggests that such interpretations do stem from, quote, the necessary correction of an immanentism quicker to attack others than to define itself. Clearly having in mind Blondell, against whom he makes the vital point, he could only have conceived that system because he possessed the Christian revelation. Even the determinate shape, scope, and contours of a philosophy open to the supernatural, cognizant by pure reason of the insufficiencies of nature and its lacks, or the insufficiencies of reason and its lacks, become undeniably different when seen through the eyes of Christian philosophers and after centuries of Christian influence. All right, so we, we close off there. The next section is philosophy in a Christian state, Jacques Moritain, and then Catholic philosophy, Maurice Blondel, which we will read next time. Um, that's that's actually a good chunk there. And then we, we have, uh, after them, neo-scholastic Thomist opponents of Christian philosophy, Thomas proponents, and then finally non-Thomistic proponents. And that will take us through the entire uh, introduction. So um, a lot of reading there. Uh, hopefully you found that interesting and useful. Um, Corey says, this is a great listen after playing worship music at church today, as is sort of like an intellectual feast, uh, you could say. I... Um, you know, when I come back to this stuff, I'm struck by how interesting and brilliant and stylistically astute most of these interlocutors, these French-speaking philosophers were. Even the, the ones who are against Christian philosophy are making eloquent cases against it. And, you know, th this is a really... Um, interesting set of, of debates. I make the case in this, this book early on and really throughout it that the issue of Christian philosophy has never had so many top-notch minds working on it as during this debate. So that doesn't mean that everything is encompassed within these debates, but if you want to think out the issue of Christian philosophy, you really probably shouldn't try to, to do it without um, you know some some engagement with the the debates and fortunately um, you know we have some of them some of the documents translated here there's also Gilson's um, uh, spirit of medieval philosophy there's there's other works as well there's probably a lot more translation work that could be done and maybe I'll do some of that down in the future. Um, Silent Hunter says Amor Fati doesn't really have anything to do with this. Uh, it's a Stoic thing or a Nietzschean thing. Uh, Ricky says, I find this very interesting and that's, that's good. Uh, the Silent Hunter basically just showing off his Latin here. I'm not sure why he's, he's looking for that sort of thing. Anybody got any, any questions, comments specifically about the topics, the thinkers, the debates, the questions raised within them? Because that's that's mostly what I'm I'm you know gonna focus on here. Um, if nobody has a anything, then we can always just cut this short. Um, but if there are any questions about the book, the topic, the background, those sorts of things, I'm happy to answer them. Um, I will point out that most of Gilson's stuff, maybe actually all of it, has been translated in one form or another, so it's quite easy to get your hands on. Um, the other people who we mentioned, particularly in this, uh, Mille Breyer has a history of philosophy that's in a number of volumes that you do you will see in older libraries, right? Um, 
And then Brunschvig, you know, uh, some of his stuff is translated. A good bit of it is not. All right, David Crosby, how deep do you feel the, no the roots of worldview are nourished by the context of the book? I don't really quite understand what you're asking, so maybe you could uh, clarify that a bit. Um, worldview can mean a lot of different things. And the context of the book, you're talking about like the debates themselves, or are you talking about the French context? Um, so maybe you can maybe you can write a little bit more about that. Silent Hunter says I like like your videos. Just hopped on, didn't know you do live chats. I do a number of kind of live chats. I do AMAs, which are general. I do these live readings. It's you know it says exactly what what we're covering here. The the book. Um, I do uh, political theory and practice discussions. Every once in a while, I'll do a philosophy pop-up. So I do, a, yeah, we do a lot of live stuff. And you can actually find them on the Reason IO calendar, on my Facebook calendar. Uh, and they're also generally, once they've been scheduled, they're, they're on the YouTube channel uh, where it says uh, live, live chats, right? So, all right, any other questions, comments? Um, Cosmogenics has an irrelevant question about getting married. Um, that's, that's not, that has nothing to do with the Christian philosophy debate. So I'm going to pass on that. That would be an AMA question. Um, so you might want to ask that the next time that we come along with that. Uh, any other questions, comments, things that you want me to engage about the Christian philosophy debates, about the thinkers, topics? Uh, Ricky, was Mondell, you mean Blondell, making a case for Christian philosophy? Indeed, he was. Um, so, Gilson was um, uh, one of the main people making a case for Christian philosophy. Um, Jacques Maritain was, Maurice Blondel, Maurice Blondel, those are the top three guys. And then uh, Antonin Sertillage, a Thomist, very underrated uh, thinker, by the way. Uh, Gabriel Marcel, Etienne Bourne, a lot of the people that are being uh, discussed here are making a case for a view of Christian philosophy. One of the issues that arises is because within the um, Christian thinkers, some of them are in some part wrongly criticizing their contemporaries as not having the right kind of Christian philosophy. All right, so David says the influence of present worldviews. So how deep do you feel the roots of present worldviews are nourished by the context of the book? Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, there's a, there's a myriad of present worldviews. So some of them, obviously, you know, people who, you know, follow Etienne Chelsea, uh, there he has followers today, would be influenced by, by him. You know, there are some Blondellians out there. Um, a lot of what's what's going on, like what we what, what they're calling rationalism there, we would call secularism now. So um, that can have some things. B, does the, does the debate have parallels in other philosophical communities at the same time? Uh, yes and no. Th th this debate is the epicenter and they have tiny little parallels. We talked about this last time, actually, in, in the, so you might want to go back to that video, uh, reading number four. Um, there were some like spin-offs, you know, the American, Philosoph American Catholic Philosophical Association by 1936 was doing a session on it. The, um, uh, you know, uh, Thomas Society of Ottawa did one. But for the most part, it's it's happening in France or in in French speaking circles, um, and there were there was as I, I also brought up in the last talk a Reformed Protestant spinoff debate that happened among Francophone Reformed uh, thinkers in the 1940s, going on into the 1950s, which is independent of the Dutch debate that really doesn't reference the French thought at all. Um, that People like Al Alvin Plantinga, who have read the Dutch stuff but not read the French stuff, uh, were, were revealed or were uh, influenced by. Uh, Tony, is there a connection between the 1930s Christian philosophy debates and the modern apologetic of presuppositionalism? I don't see any real connection between them. Um, the silent hunter, what the thinker thinks, the prover proves, revelation. I don't even know what that, that means. So um, any other questions about the... Uh, 
the debates, the book, the context. B, what are the key weaknesses in Blondell's reading of his opponents? There's only one key weakness, a lack of a lack of charity and thinking that. And it's the same weakness in Gilson and Moritan's position. As so many other of the thinkers pointed out, they each think that their position, Gilson and Moritan on one side and Blondell on the other, is incompatible with the other person's position when really they're they're complementary. That's that's the only real weakness that that's there. Um, and it's really weird and unfortunate, and it has much more to do with like personality conflicts and old beefs that those two sets couldn't like come to productive terms. Um, and it's interesting because because Blondell was not translated over here, um, except for you know like Action and stuff like that. And because Gilson and Maritain, their stuff was translated over here, and they did teach over here, and they influenced a whole you know like set of generations of people. The Gilson and Maritain take became like the standard take, even though it was on that point wrong. Cosmogenics, Augustine of Hippo. Why in the East his teachings are more disputed and were notably attacked by Joan Ramades? Uh, you, you pick any theologian, and you can find somebody attacking their stuff. So that's not an index of anything. Augustine is essentially a Latin doctor. He writes in, in, in Latin. They don't read much Latin over, you know, past uh, a certain point. And they had their own uh, other doctors that they were into. You know, um, that's about it. Damn it. What would you say is the most difficult aspect of translating philosophical works? Well, other than like knowing the language, <laughs> you need to actually know, know the language uh, that you're translating from. For me, one of the toughest things is being willing to say, okay, this is probably as good as it's going to get. I'm not going to tinker with this anymore or do additional research or writing because you, you there, there is no perfect translation right and sometimes um you might think of a better way of expressing something later on but um you know you can only get so far with it right i i, I will say this i've been translating works uh, i first my first translations were actually from latin as part of the aquinas translation project way back in the 1990s as a, uh, a graduate student. And then I translated works from German and French. Um, I provide my own translations when I'm working from Greek texts uh, as well, you know, like uh, Epictetus or Marcus Aurelius, or I mean, I'll consult other people's translations. I have, um, through the work of translating, become much more forgiving of other people's translations you know, um, than I was before because I realized how how messy a process it is. B, has Blondell had more influence on later Christian thinkers influenced by post-structuralism than his contemporaries? Um, no, I wouldn't say so. Um, Blondell's influence has largely been within Catholic circles. Um, and he had immediate massive influence from the beginning, uh, well, actually before the, the 20th century began. Many Thomists have been influenced by Blondell, you know, including some of the ones that, you know, are, should be considered very, very reliable. Norris Clark is a great example, right? Um, Antonin Sertian, who I've mentioned, Bruno de Solage, those are not post-structuralist thinkers. Post-structuralists tend to be um, with, with, you know, it depends on what you mean by post-structuralist, too. Is, is Jean-Luc Marion a post-structuralist? Probably not, because he doesn't engage structuralism as, at all. You know, he engages Derrida, but is Derrida even post-structuralist, or is he deconstructionist? Deconstructionist, you know, uh, it's it's kind of debatable. I would say that most of the thinkers who are who would classify themselves as post-structuralists are really not interested in Christianity much at all. So. Um, David, would you use, use scripturalism as a determining issue of the time? I have no idea what's meant by scripturalism. Um, that's, that's not a term that generally gets used in, in this sort of thing, and it could mean a million different things. Uh, we have to be very, very careful in throwing out terms that may be taken from this tiny little Christian context here with this you know, com you know, community and blowing them up to mean you know, 
uh, like general terms that everybody else would know. You always got to explain where the term's coming from and, and, and what it means. All right. Well, we're, we're pretty much at the end of the hour. Uh, any other quick questions or comments or stuff like that? Um, if not, I'm going to get back on with other work that I got to get done today for my, my classes, and we'll, we'll do more of these uh, in the month. Um, hopefully, we can get through, uh, maybe we can get through the rest of the introduction this month and then start getting into the actual translations themselves, which are, you know, pretty sizable. We might have to break some of them into to chunks. We'll, we'll see what happens. But... All right. Um, let me say, have a great whatever you've got left of your day and weekend. Um, some of you, if you're far enough, are already in the next day. Um, most of you are, you know, either in your afternoon or evening time. Um, so I'll, I'll w wish all of you a good little bit left of the weekend, and I'll see you next time.